Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, this is our second quarter development session on PKP uh, current development activities from the dev team. Um, we'll talk about some active work we've got going, some events we've had recently, uh, an update of the roadmap, and uh, what we can look forward to in the next little while. Um, Today we've got uh, some familiar folks from previous sessions, if you've joined these before, uh, Vitaly and Yarda, Bojana and Devika. Um, but we've also got Eric joining us, and he's going to be um, joining the Dev Leads group um, for the first time and in the future. Uh, Eric has been a developer with PKP for uh, some years and um, came actually to the Dev team from the hosting team, so he's got experience there as well. And he's going to be joining the Dev Leads group to talk to steward our API development. Um, a number of us do work that touches on the API, but the API has never really had one person to uh, shepherd it and make choices to make sure that it kind of develops into a, uh, a coherent API with better coverage. Um, so welcome, Eric. I also want to wel welcome three new developers. We actually just started, we tried to hire one developer and we ended up with three very good candidates. And so um, we recently welcomed Hafsa and Tazlin and Caitlin on the dev team. Um, so welcome to them as well. Uh, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes doing a, a roadmap review. And um, this is going to be kind of picking up on what we talked about last time. I want to do these and kind of talk about uh, any changes that we've introduced and just kind of give everyone a sense of uh, how we're working towards these goals. So OGS, OMP, and OPS 3.4.0. Those are the current uh, most recent releases, the newest branch, and it's not an LTS branch, not an, a long-term support branch. Um, since last time we spoke a few months back, uh, we did release 3.3.0-17 LTS and 3.4.0-5. Um, those were to resolve some security issues around cross-site scripting and template injection. So I do recommend users of either 3.3.0 or 3.4.0 to adopt those. I'm not aware of anybody in the wild abusing uh, these potential issues with cross-site scripting, but it's a good practice to update. Um, a lot of translations came in for 3.4.0. Um, I'm sure there's more I haven't checked recently, but there's a lot more translations uh, coming in all the time. So big thanks to our translators for that work. Um, this quarter we expect, or perhaps in the next month, I would say we'll probably release um, 3.3.0-18 and 3.4.0-6. Um, 3.4.0-6 is going to fix one issue with editorial assignments during upgrade. There's potential data loss in that, so I'd like to get that one uh, released and fixed. Otherwise, a lot of minor fixes, a lot of little tweaks here and there, some translation updates, that sort of thing. Um, just to review where we are with a 3.5.0 roadmap, that's planned for release in quarter four this year. It might slip to first quarter next year. I'd rather it didn't just because we've had, uh, we've tried to avoid end of year releases. It really is a tough schedule to keep with everyone going on vacation and the translators being busy and all that sort of thing. So I want to try and keep it to fourth quarter 2024, but just a heads up, it might shift off to first quarter 2025. The 3.5 release will be designated LTS, long-term support. So those of you who are using 3.3 can plan to upgrade to 3.5 sometime in the next kind of year at your convenience uh, once that's designated LTS, and then you'll be able to use that branch for a kind of three to five year window, knowing that it'll be updated, it'll stay stable, and that you can uh, rely on it. Those who are looking for more rapid updates can use the non-LTS releases that come up between the LTS releases and uh, make quicker use of the new features that come out in those. Um, the major features for 3.5, this is a review from last time. The big thing is a rework of submission lists, and you'll see something about that during this presentation. We'll go into that in some detail. Um, ORCID and Credit are getting integrated instead of being uh, plugins. You'll see some about ORCID in particular uh, during this presentation. There's some work on JATS. There's some invitation tools in GDPR. Those are through um, the very, very generous work of our, our partners with the Craft OA project who are contributing developer time and working with us quite hard on some tricky features. There's also editorial board management. This is for the Integrity Initiative and uh, trying to give transparency to readers about the composition of the editorial boards of journals so they know uh, who's there uh, and have some evidence of that through uh, cross-linking with ORCID, and uh, some improvements to multilingual metadata ed entry and management. Um, we've just added to this list uh, RUR integration. So much like with ORCID and credit, um, these standards, when they become indispensable to the scholarly ecosystem, we like to then integrate them into the core application instead of having them in as plugins. And it's easier for us to do kind of nicer integrations when things aren't plugins. We're doing the same thing with the Roar support, and that's thanks to Tib, and I believe their work with Craft away that they're doing that. 
Um, I wanted to spend just a moment talking about dependencies. Um, this is the tools that OJS and OMP and OPS rely upon from third parties. And two of the major ones, of course, are Laravel, which is increasingly the big platform that provides a lot of infrastructural support for our software. But then underlying that, of course, is PHP, which is the language that we're, we're coding in. Um, when we release an LTS release, we commit to a three to five year window of the application being maintained and stable. Um, and of course, that means that we have to trust that the underlying infrastructure that we use is also going to be safe and reliable for that three to five year window. Three to five years in software is a long time. Um, so it's important for us when we first get an LTS release out there to have a modern set of requirements so that over those three to five years, towards the end of the life cycle of the LTS release, um, we don't have uh, those dependencies kind of dropping dead on us. So uh, it means we have to be a little bit more careful about what we use early in the release. Um, we've decided we're going to bump the requirements for uh, for OGS 3.5 to support Laravel version 11. And as you can see here, Laravel version 11 uh, was released uh, in March this year, so it's fairly fresh. By the time we get it, we get OGS 3.5 uh, released, it's going to be in the middle of its kind of life cycle, and it'll get security fixes until March 2026. That's still early days in that three to five year window that we commit to maintaining uh, the software for, but it is the newest version of Laravel. And as you can see, the older versions of Laravel have uh, much uh, more proximate um, end of life dates. So by targeting the newest kind of stable one, it means that towards the end of our cycle for 3.5, um, we'll be able to then hopefully make some minor bumps just to make stability uh, maintained. Um, but we'll be able to make that three to five year window without having too much trouble. Um, the trouble is that uh, Laravel version 11 requires as its minimum PHP version 8.2. I know for a number of you, that's going to feel like a very modern requirement. Uh, PHP 8.2, this is the um, the chart of PHP maintained releases. 8.2 is currently, in fact, the oldest of the active maintenance stable versions. Green here is active maintenance. Uh, orange here is security fixes. And then beyond that is end of life and you actually shouldn't be uh, relying on that software to be secure. Um, so we're kind of beholden to this mix of requirements. Um, I know that for a lot of you, even running PHP 8.x is uh, is a challenge. Um, I think that's gonna change in the next little while. I just wanna reassure you that we're doing our best to make sure that we don't get overly ambitious with our requirements. Um, I know that a lot of you are going to be running 3.3 for a lot, a lot longer. And even though 3.5 will be the new LTS, we'll give you a year's window at least to be able to uh, make the upgrades before we really start pushing folks to make the update. By the time that 3.3 is no longer maintained and 3.5 is the stable LTS for folks to use, I'm confident that uh, an environment that's gonna host that baseline requirement is gonna be available to you. And if it's not, don't worry, we'll make sure that we are, are, are continuing to support you um, until it's no longer feasible for any of us. So, um, yeah, I want to assuage some anxiety about these requirements. I do think it's the best balance we can strike, and I want to be transparent about why that is the case. Okay, enough about that. Um, I think we're on to submission lists next to present some of the work that's coming into 3.5, and I believe I turn that over to Devika. Um, Devika, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just um, uh, share my screen in a bit to show you, but like after nearly a year and a half of like designing, user testing and development, we're really excited to present the demo of our submissions list, which are almost like 90% complete. So each element of the submission list was like thoroughly user tested with invaluable help from our community and partners like CLO. Thanks to their guidance, our current submissions lists display all the crucial information everyone needs. Um, you can easily assess the status of the submission and determine the next steps uh, to move it forward. The key actions such as making primary editorial mm -hmm. decision or um, checking reviewer status, assigning editors or uploading revisions can now be performed directly from the dashboard or the summary screen, reducing the number of clicks. Uh, I will now walk you through the entire demo. So I will just share my screen and give me a bit. Mm. 
let me know if my screen is visible. Not yet for me. Oh, here it comes. Yep, now it is. Okay. So we log into our portal and then you will see um, this new dashboard. Um, over here, you'll see all your uh, navigations. Basically, they are like um, filters and sorters for you to see submissions based on a particular status or category. So for example, if you wanted to check any submission that needs editors, you can go there. Of course, this current demo does not have it, but you can see that. Um, if you want to see all in peer review stage, you can see all of them which are in peer review stage. If you want to see any assignments which are awaiting reviews or they need reviewers to be assigned. So this list was collated after the user testing wherein uh, the most used kind of filters um, uh, that were being used to like sort the submissions are now here so that you can easily sort the submissions. Now, if I come on active submissions, you can see there's an ability to like sort by ID. Um, it's a bit slow, but like that would happen. You can also see the submissions with respect to the author, uh, the, the name of the submission. You can see what stage it is in. Days are to do. But basically, you'll see the number of days in which like a particular like um, submission is in. So basically, you'll be able to see how many days the submission is in the copy editing stage or how many days it is in the desk review stage or the production stage. Um, there's also an editorial activity um, section, which basically will be able to indicate what all is going on with your submission, right? So currently, you can see that you have the review sections, but we are it's going to grow and become more sophisticated to show you things like, um, I'm just going to be sharing my whole screen. So basically, it's going to go to show you things like the assign your editors or assign reviewers or the fact that revisions were submitted by an author. So you can actually assess where your submission is. Um, it can also show you if it is scheduled to be published or if um, you need to assign a section editor on copy editing. So it will basically be help you to take all these decisions from the dashboard itself. And then we have the summary stage. Um, so to show you the summary stage, I'll just go on desk review. So it will basically give you like an overview of your submissions and um, help you take all the primary editorial decisions along with showing you all the metadata of um, the submission. So you don't really have to click and go inside the workflow to see what's happening or take a decision. You can see the overview very well over here. You can like see your activity log and it will show you all the history and the notes. You can like download the desk review files. Um, you can also send the submission for review if you want. So it will basically go into like the review stage and you can perform like the primary editorial or uh, editorial decision over here. If you want to cancel, you can cancel decision. It's going to take you back to the submissions list without you having to go back to the dashboard and sort everything all over again. I will show you an example of what happens when you see something in the review stage, right? So if you see this uh, ID Christopher in the review stage, you can see like these two bubbles. If you click on the bubbles, it's going to give you an indication of the status of that particular reviewer. So here you can see that Julie Jensen, we're awaiting response from the reviewer. You can see the kind of review it is that if it's open, or like closed, you'll be able to see the status. You can edit your due date. Um, you can also um, view details of this uh, particular review and you can also unassign the reviewer. Same way if say we've received a review, you can see like the review was completed. Mm -hmm. 
you can um, see that it's an open review and you'll see the date on which it was performed. You can read the recommendation. So all the actions for which you all had to like basically go into the workflow and take. Now everything can be done from the, from the dashboard. So if I click on the summary, on the summary, you can see any revisions that were submitted. You can see the files which were there for review. You can see the reviewer status. You can also um, request revisions. Um, you can also cancel a review round if you want to. Okay, I ran into error there. But like you can also decline submission. Um, and from the summary stage, say if you really want to go into the workflow stage, you can just like click on view submission in detail and you can go on the workflow stage and see your submissions. Um, so the same thing is there for like copy editing and production. You'll be able to do all of it. You can also assign to an issue. So I can like click on an issue, save, and it gets saved and assigned to an issue automatically. I can also schedule it for publication, um, directly from the dashboard. Um, and I can also start a new submission. And I can search a submission by ID. See, I can like type words and that's going to be there. If you feel like you need even more sophisticated filtering mechanism, you can click on filters and say I can click on articles. I can click on applied science and I can, you know, maybe 54 days since the last activity and I apply filters. It's going to show all the filters above and it's going to give you data about the submissions. Currently, in this permutation combination, there are no submissions. But if I was to cancel and it's going to automatically keep refreshing and giving you re results, um, you can also clear all the filters and it's going to throw all your things back. Uh, so this is the demo of our new submissions list. Uh, we're still working on it to make it uh, even more better. But uh, for more updates, I'll pass it on to Yarda. Thank you. And let me just invite anybody who'd like to, to ask questions using the Q&A tool. Um, and we'll maybe open them. Uh, we'll we'll answer those as they're relevant when they come in but if we don't have time we can always come back to them at the end of the presentation as well um yarda go ahead yeah like if you can uh, share the presentation again i have a couple of slides there <laughs> yes i should um, have been ready for this let me just find that um that's okay um so i would really like to, uh thank you uh Dedica, for for a demo uh it mostly worked and given that it's you know, under heavy uh, development, it's changing every day. It's getting better every day. Um, we can go even one slide, you know, back. Yeah. Um, uh, then, you know, uh, e e even though it's it's not done, I am excited that we were able to share, you know, the progress and see how it looks in the practice. And um, and we have a couple more things that we need to finalize, which here I call as a essential functionality, but it basically let you do everything um, that it kind of suggesting that it uh, let you do. So all the actions, um, even like the cases where uh, we have special workflow for uh, recommend Odal editor, for example. So all these uh, scenarios uh, needs to be uh, supported first. And then the uh, from development point of view, uh, the important milestone I am aiming for is to basically make the submission listing enabled by default in uh, on our main development branch. So it would replace uh, the previous one. And that will basically expose this new functionality to the whole team. So they will see it by uh, default if they are uh, working on the new things. And also, uh, it will be a lot easier for community to actually see how it works. Currently, it will be a little bit tricky to actually make it work because um, you need to know uh, which branches uh, to look at, um, etc. So, I believe we are like a couple of weeks from from this milestone, and um, and in 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 that moment, uh, there is still lots to be done, uh, but it will be uh, you know becoming basically as a part of the OGS. 
Um, obviously, on our development branch, we are running our end-to-end -end tests to make sure that we are not uh, creating regressions. So it will require to also make the adjustments to these tests. Uh, so that will be part of that uh, milestone. And then we will basically iteratively keep uh, improving it. Um, one of the areas uh, that Devika mentioned is the editorial activity. Uh, we are already indicating lots of these um, things there for uh, some scenarios, but there is st still a lot to come. It takes some time to work out uh, uh, to from where to extract the information so it's reliable, um, it's it's well tracked in the database and, and so forth. So these are like coming um, over time. Um, uh, obviously, it's good to remind that the plan is uh, once we have that all uh, working in the OJS, we will start working on the adjustments to make it work for OMP and OPS. And... Um, while working on this, uh, we also recognize that there is lots of uh, need to uh, bring custom functionality uh, to these screens uh, because we can't ever cover everything that uh, people might need. So uh, we need to, you know, let plugins to uh, help with that. So I, uh, in the next slide, I just wanted to give you like a sneak peek uh, how we think about the extensibility for these particular screens. So, like, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so here you can see the summary um, uh, that you saw on the demo, which basically uh, have these three main areas, uh, one big column on the left and uh, two columns on the right. And each of them is literally just as a view of list of Vue.js components. And so how to think about the extensibility is that um, if you want to actually display there something custom, something yours on any of these areas, uh, first step would be create your own uh, custom Vue.js component, uh, register it, and then uh, there needs to be mechanism to actually define when to display these components on these, um, uh, on these sections. So this is like the main uh, idea, and it, it was built in uh, this um, idea in mind. There obviously uh, needs to be a little bit more work uh, to expose all the functionality for the plugins uh, to be able to actually do it and provide examples. So that will come a little bit later. But at this point, um, I've, I wanted to basically share what our intention is there. And if we go to the next slide, Uh, this uh, this show uh, the submission listing itself, uh, where you basically have a uh, chance to create your custom column, which is in general probably the best if you want to display something very custom. But you can also extend the editorial activity because the editorial activity is also just a list of the Vue.js components stuck on top of each, of each other. So there is still opportunity to also sneak in some additional information there if that's something you... Uh, would want to do but there might be some other use cases that are not really uh, covered uh, maybe there are some other areas uh, that we should make um, easy to extend from the plugins and for that i created the issue that is um, uh, linked on on this slide um, where i would like to ask you if you are aware of the plugin uh, that would uh, need to extend these screens from previous versions uh, or something you already are thinking of something you would like to uh, create in the plugin for our next version uh, please uh, this issue is uh, probably the best place to actually provide that feedback so if you can provide maybe a screenshot or some video or some description what you would like to achieve with your plugins uh, this will really help me once I'm working on re refining this extensibility to consider these use cases um, and that's all from me today Thank you very much. And I will hand it over. Let's see. I think it's Vitaly next on the eloquent ORM integration. And I will say um, we're currently working, uh, Yard has been doing a lot of infrastructural work to support uh, this new toolkit that we're integrating for the submission lists. And it's going to make things like plugin extensions a lot easier. We're already working with Ubiquity Press on some of this. Um, 
He's also been getting feedback from TIB uh, in a couple of different ways, one through Craft08, another through some citation assistant work that they're doing that we're excited to see released before too long. So watch for that. Um, early feedback on how we can make the infrastructure better really does help. So we appreciate that that work with, uh, with third parties. Um, Vitaly, are you ready to go? Yes. Perfect. So the next, uh, I will shortly tell about uh, uh, deeper Laravel integration that is planned for 3.5, uh, about eloquent uh, object related, uh, relative mapper, if I uh, spell that abbreviation correctly. So next slide, please. Uh, so what is uh, eloquent ORM? It's abs uh, the abstract layer to interact with, uh, with a data base which is shipped with Laravel framework. Yeah? And it's in, uh, it's in line with our uh, current strategy to rely more on, on our infrastructural side, on uh, tool side like Laravel and code less our own uh, homebrew stuff. Uh, and that helps uh, to maintain uh, uh, the code better. Uh, what it does, it replaces our uh, uh, old DEO patterns uh, pattern, and uh, it interacts. And now interaction with OGS uh, entities is done via Laravel modules. Next slide, uh, please. So this is our old structure, uh, repository pattern that we used uh, after our previous pattern with ADODB, or stuff. So uh, it uh, includes schema, the mapper for entity pro uh, that maps entity properties with their values, uh, the collector, which implements uh, Laravel query builder to retrieve the, uh, the data, the collection of entities. Uh, then it's DO, which interacts with database. Uh, then it's a repository, the interface for interaction and manage entities, and the entity itself. And thanks to Dimitris, our first entity stage assignment uh, is now refactored uh, to use this pattern. So next slide, please. And now all that is uh, replaced by eloquent model. It maps. Uh, the entity, uh, we now can retrieve data uh, properties di uh, directly from the uh, model itself. It's also responsible for creation, insertion, and up updates uh, of entities. So much less code, uh, as you can see now. Next slide, please. Uh, this, this is an, an example of uh, new, new stage assignments. Uh, as can be seen here, it's uh, table name, primary key, and all this information can be found on the Laravel website, on the documentation regarding eloquent ORM. Uh, what is specific here, probably, it's a way how we now use filters. There is a public fu function which is called uh, scope with submission IDs. This is a way how now we can filter results uh, when we are trying to get uh, the collection of stage assignments, now we can use filters uh, in accordance to our previous pattern this way. So as you can see, this is a call on a query builder with specified request. Next slide, please. And here are several examples how uh, we can interact with uh, uh, stage assignment entities through a Laravel model. So we now can, once again, filter results uh, in the second block, uh, code block. Uh, there is an example how we can retrieve an array of properties from a direct call to stage assignment model. Uh, and the short example is a typical example how we now can create uh, a new model, a new stage assignment, and how we can call to properties. One thing that uh, I should mention is that 
for creation, we can use camel case for properties and for retrieving properties uh, also you can use camel case. But for example, in a, in a second code block, uh, as, as we interact directly with a query builder and with a model, uh, I'm using a snake case uh, to uh, which represents a column name to retrieve uh, actual data. And soon, uh, I hope you will see more of our entities uh, refactored to use this pattern. Thanks, that's it for me. Thanks, Vitaly. I think uh, Bojana is up next. And you'll see um, this is going to be a very gradual refactor because we have so many entities in the system. Part of what we have to ensure when we adopt a new model is that there's ways for new patterns to coexist with old patterns. And uh, the good news is that uh, there is forward and backward compatibility, basically, when interacting with a mixture of entity DAO and Eloquent or uh, ORM and even the old DAO uh, code that we have. So we're going to con continue to um, renovate the software in an ongoing fashion. But the, one of the goals here is that um, if you're hiring a PHP developer or you are a PHP developer, you're used to working with Laravel most likely, uh, you won't have to learn a whole new tool set when you come over to working on OJS. You'll be able to make use of those existing patterns. Um, Pojana, over to you. Hello, thank you. Um, I like you can jump to the next slide. I would like to mention or present the work done by the Project Craft OA on improving indexability for multilingual sites. Uh, following Google recommendations to make the indexing of the multilingual sites easier and uh, thus to help users find the right page easier, we have introduced different URLs for different language uh, versions. Uh, here are two examples of URLs with language. The UI language comes after the context or after the general part in the URL. Then we also uh, tell Google about different versions of a page for different languages. For that, uh, we are using HTML text. We add one HTML link element for each page variant, including itself of the, um, to the um, page header. Uh, um, here's a, here are two examples for English and French article uh, view page. And uh, additionally, we add the fallback page for unmatched languages. This is the original uh, or old uh, URL pattern that we have without the language. Uh, Alec, you can go to the next slide. So the original uh, or previous URL without language uh, will still work. And once uh, the user requests the URL without language, it is re redirected uh, to the URL with the language which the language that is saved in the user cookie or the context primary language. And this uh, original URL without language, we also uh, disseminate or provide to the ser services like Crossref, DOIJ, etc. For the journals, presses, or servers that uh, have only single language, nothing changes. Um, here is also the link to the Google search optimization guides we followed and the link to the GitHub issues. And maybe just to thanks uh, again, or once again, to the CraftOA team for the work they, they have done. So that would be all for me. Thanks, Bojana. And uh, I think up next is Eric's talk about ORCID and the core. There is one question I see about the change in version 3.4 in DOI assignment. Um, Eric, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to read that question. Probably there's more context required and I might might direct somebody to the support forum to ask that question over there. But uh, Eric, if you do want to say a few words about this one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for the DOI question, I think I would uh, ask that the user go to the forum to provide a little more context in order to give a more complete answer. Um, based on what I am seeing there, I don't necessarily see what the 
um, challenges would be. So I think I would need to have more context to help provide an answer there. Um, but for ORCID, um, I'd like to share a little bit about what we have been doing to move the ORCID functionality into the core from a plugin. So to provide a little bit of context for where things have been, the ORCID functionality has existed as a bundled plugin for OJS since 2016, and for, it has existed for both OJS and OPS. And our goal with this change is to preserve the existing functionality while making the architectural and user facing improvements including adding in functionality for OMP. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I just wanna highlight a few of the changes and I initially tried to group these into a few different categories of architectural changes and user-facing changes, but it turns out that when we're working with something as complex as the ORCID functionality, which has grown quite a bit over the years, most of these end up touching on a few different things. So I thought I would just hit on a few of the highlights here. So one of them is, of an architectural change, which is to make greater use of queued jobs and other common paradigms from the Laravel community. So things like using single purpose actions. And with the goal here is to offload time consuming and background processes so that when you click a button to have it do some work, you don't have to sit there and wait for the browser spinner to go round and round while it's doing the background work. So you can get that done and move on. And if something does go wrong, it will let you know in one way or another. Another change that we wanted to make sure was happening was to make as much of the code reusable as possible, especially wanting to add in support for OMP and support all three applications. A lot of the ORCID functionality is the same across all three. So we wanted to make sure as much of it was being consolidated in the shared PKP library as possible. There are also the opportunity for making some UI UX improvements common to all of the workflows. I'll provide a few screenshots and examples of this in just a moment. And finally, one other issue that has cropped up is adding an addition of the verification status for this. So what I mean by this is previously when an ORCID, when the ORCID plugin was not enabled, a user could use a free text input to input an ORCID. And there was some validation around making sure that the URL looked like an ORCID, but there was no guarantee that this ORCID belonged to the person who put it into the form. So what we are doing is adding in a badge in order to indicate the status of the ORCID so that if a user has gone through the process of verifying their ORCID, it will be indicated as such. And what we want to make sure that all of the historical ORCID IDs that exist are not removed from this. And so what we're going to move towards is having a badge that indicates whether an ORCID has been verified by a user or not. And then in the editorial backend, when an unauthenticated ORCID appears, there will be information about how to go about making sure that is authenticated so that we have the idea moving forward that whenever an end user sees an ORCID, they can know for sure whether or not the author has authorized that ORCID to be there or not, so that it's further proof of identity and showing that they are associating this work with their ORCID. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a screenshot of the new ORCID site settings page. One of the challenges that we've had is oftentimes institutions will be running multiple journals off of a single OJS install, and they might want to have the ORCID site settings apply to all of their journals, so their API key, the client ID, the client secret. And previously, this was configured in the config.inc.php file, and it required a system administrator to go in, edit that file if they had to update which type of API they were using, or if they needed to update their client ID and client secret. This will now be part of the admin side of the OJS interface so that a journal manager, or sorry, rather a site administrator or anyone with that access to the site can go in and do that, and they don't have to contact a systems administrator to go in and edit it directly on the server. Uh, next slide, please. And this is another screenshot of the contributor form. And in the middle, there's the new ORCID uh, widget. And this is making use of the view components that we have in the form. This is a new ORCID field. And it bundles up a lot of the functionality that would be common in the editorial workflow. In this example, we see that the ORCID has already been added. 
there's the green verification badge as well as a delete button. So previously there were checkboxes. You would click those checkboxes and save the entire form. Now you're able to perform these various orchid functionalities within this component. You're able to delete it there. You're able to request that that contributor verify and authorize their orchid. And if there is a legacy orchid that has not been verified, a note will be there for the editor to say, this author has not provided or verified this orchid, you should do so. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, th this has just been the beginning of the ORCID work. There are still some things to come in the next stages, one of which is better surfacing of this verification status. The example I just showed is so far the only example of that. Um, but we want to integrate that throughout the application as well as on the user-facing front end or the reader-facing front end. Uh, next step, we'll also be integrating this ORCID work into the upcoming user invitation workflow. So when users are invited to create roles or people are invited to create user accounts, they will have the opportunity to link their ORCID as part of that workflow. And we also want to add deeper integration with OMP. So currently in OJS and OPS, you can submit your works and review contributions if you're using the ORCID member API. We want to add that functionality to OMP as well. And that's all I have for ORCID. Thanks, Eric. And I see there's a comment. A quick question. The affiliation field in that screenshot, is that free text or pulling in the raw data? Maybe I'll go back to that screenshot. Absolutely. That is currently using the free text, but once the ROAR integration is in, it will be pulling in the ROAR. So this is just in my copy of the development branch. So once that is implemented, that will also be there and the ORCID will be able to pull in that information as such as well. And just a quick word on our approach with ROAR. ROAR will always be optional uh, because we, we can't guarantee that there's going to be complete coverage of the whole global um, Research, research institution list is going to be covered entirely by that database. So for folks who are able to choose a ROAR identified um, institution, they'll be guided to do that. But for folks who want to continue to enter plain text, they will be able to, but there will be a separation of those uh, affiliations into multiple fields. So you can list multiple affiliations without having to join them together with a comma or something, regardless of whether they are ROAR or non-ROAR identifiers. Perfect. Um, Next up, I believe, is Devika. On, oh, here we are on Roars. <laughs> Sorry to steal your fire there, Devika. OK. Um, I will just share my screen, Alec. Is that OK? Uh, let me know if my screen is visible. Yes, that's working. OK. So I'll walk you through a design prototype of showing how to add uh, multiple ROAR and non-ROAR affiliations. And Ghazi, um, Alec, Bojana, and I have been like working on it and brainstorming through it. Um, so I will just walk you through. It's a design prototype, so it's not on development. So there will be a few glitches, but I will try my best. So basically, once you come to like the app contributor page, you can like put in all your information and then you come on the affiliation section where it states that enter the full name of the institution below, avoiding any acronyms. And you select the name from the drop down and click add to include the affiliation in your profile. So stay in this uh, table. I start typing the institute name, um, which is University of and I'll start getting all like the sections um, and all the recommendations. Say for example, if they are affiliated, it would have like the icon next to it, along with like this link for you to verify and check if it's the right ROAR. So say for example, I, I want to select University of Toronto, but I'm still on the edge of like, it's the correct thing. So I will just click on it. And it's going to take me to uh, the University of Toronto page, wherein I can check and select if it's the right university. Maybe I want to check for Mel Melbourne. It's going to work the same for all. Um, and now I'm oh, and I want to click University of Toronto, and it will show translations available because um, um, since we have affiliated it and connected it with Roar. And now if I click on it, I can see all the translations autofilled, which is like Portuguese, Spanish, French, which is the languages we have selected. 
if I want to like um, close this, I can close this and then I'll click on add. And once I click on add, it's going to give me an option to add like another institute. Now, say I start typing University of again, and now I want to add University of Bath. Um, so I click on it and the same functionality will happen. And I'll click on add and it's going to add the University of Bath and allow me to like add another affiliation if I want to. So let's say I start typing Nigra. And as I'm typing, I'll keep getting recommendations, right? Uh, but say I continue typing and I get and I type Nigra Association of Medicine, which um, is not there in the list, uh, but I can still click on it. It's just not going to have um, the link to view it or the roar icon next to it, but I will click on it and it's going to take me to Nigra Association of Medicine and it's and I will have the option to input uh, the institute name in like all the languages. Um, maybe I don't do it now and I just click on add. It's going to give me an indication that one of four languages completed. Say if I want to like edit this or add the other languages, I can just click on edit institute name and it's going to open the same thing in the column um, and you can like type the name and in all your languages and then click on add again and then continue the process. So this way you can keep adding multiple affiliations. Um, this is also going to help us in identifying. So if we're connecting to any raw affiliations, it's also going to help us identify editors working in the same organizations as authors, which I will just show you all in a minute. But um, this is how you can add multiple affiliations right now to your um, account. So I'll just move to the next uh, bit, which is seeing the editor load, right? Um, so basically, we're also implementing the feature to indicate editor workload when assigning editors to a submission. Uh, so Tim Wakeford's team will be handling the development and here's a sneak peek into the design. So if you can see that when we are, say, adding a user, right, um, or like adding a user to a submission, we can like search um, by an account, right, by, by a role, say, I click on journal editor, right? And um, in the table, I will see the name of the editors. I will see what all active submissions they are working on. I can also see their affiliations, which you can see in this case, I've given all the ones which are integrated with ROAR. Um, if you can see, it also indicates that it's the same institution as the author. And it also indicates um, uh, all your interests. And so you can select and make like a very detailed and accurate decision. Um, so the idea was to enhance the editor assignment process by providing more detailed information. Um, this way, the assigning editor can view useful data uh, to guide their assignments. So some of the considerations that we've made is that the active submission column will all uh, will show all assignments currently from the submissions until they are published. So submissions that have been declined or published will not be counted. And the second one is the active submissions column will only uh, take the selected role into the account. So if, for example, um, if journal editor is selected, uh, then it will show only the active assignments that the user has as a journal editor. It will not indicate the assignments they have, say, as a section editor or an author. So that's one of the considerations that we have. Um, so I'll move on to the next bit, which is quite an interesting development work that we're doing. So I'm and I'm very enthusiastic about it. And I've been like discussing a lot with a lot of people. So here's um so I'd like to share a preview of my work in progress where I present two options of the form fields that have been tested for like development feasibility and accessibility following the best UXUI practices, which to be honest, some of them I also learned during the process. Um, 
Uh, so these will include, uh, these will expand. So like the options that I'm showing will expand to show five, six more options of form fields in our workflow, uh, which I will then test in different languages like German, Arabic, Spanish. And once I'm done with all the prototypes, I'm going to be conducting a user test session. So if any of y'all are interested, please reach out to us. It would be amazing. So I will now just walk you through one of the options of the form field. So basically, if you see in option one, I you click on like make a submission. If you see the stepper has been retained, but now the stepper is followed by a very um like a very systematic way of showing the forms. So you can see everything that's required so you can see the submission language required you can see like an indication you can continue to choose languages and go on into this um, form um, you can cancel it you can also see the last saved which we also have now say I continue submission and I come on the second step which is details so any title that I inputted in the first bit would come over here and if say I'm typing, uh, it's going to focus to show the area that's selected much, like in a much better way. And now say, what about the form fields, right? Like if I had to indicate it in multiple languages, the globe had to go, but there had to be some other way, a more intuitive way of indicating this. So basically you can see that there's an indication of fill multilingual data, which is yet to be filled. And when I click on it, it comes side by side next to each other, all the languages. Um, I can click on it and it's gonna go away. I can click again, it's gonna come back. And the same way you can keep going for like keywords, it shows you indications, like if it's complete, then it's gonna show a tick. If you wanna go, you can click on it and it's going to show all the translations that are there. The same way for abstract, for references, I can continue submission. Um, and it's going to take me for like an upload file section wherein I could either I can drag or drop the file or click to upload the file. It will also show me like the files that have already been uploaded and an option to select um, the type of file more intuitively. And I basically made it into a component so that we can extend this even further and utilize it to show, oh, say, versioning and things like that. This is uh, like a way of showing if the file is getting uploaded. Now, say I continue submission and I come on the contributors page, I can see a contributor and see if I want to add the contributor. I'll go on it. The form is in the same way. I can keep filling. If I want to see multilingual data, I'll click on it. There's an indication which will always. Um, so even uh, with respect to everyone coming from different visual abilities, um, they'll also be able to like access uh, this um, and anyone reading from a screen reader as well will be able to navigate through this very clearly. I've also added the affiliation bit here that I just showed you all. And if I click on add contributor, it gets added. I can click on set primary contact and it's going to like set it. And I can continue submission, any comments, uh, we can add those as well. And once I continue submission, this is how the review page is now going to go. It's going to show you the details in every language that you have picked because I didn't add any. It's going to keep showing none provided. And if I want to edit, I can like go on edit and it's going to go back to that page for me to edit. The same way it's, you can see it's in files. I've uh, taken the same components that we've used in the submissions list over here so that the whole experience becomes more predictable and intuitive. Um, and this is uh, the way it's going to be. So this was option one, wherein there was like two columns of um, uh, like column one was the questions and column two was where you could input the answers. But there is like a second way of doing this, which is basically 
my type B testing, which is basically a single weight. There are no two columns. It's just one column where everything is one below the other. So the same way, like the submission language, title. So instead of two columns, you can see now it's just one section. It will go ahead. I can continue submission. It works in the same way. The fill multilingual data bit is um, going to work in the same way as well. Like I can like click on fill multilingual data and it's going to show me everything that's there. Uh, okay, wait. So you can see, sorry, my prototype was glitching, but you can see that you can the you can expand and collapse the multilingual form field data to see. You can go on continue submission, exactly the same. It's just that one is in two, one is in one. Um, so what am I going to do next is that I'm going to be calling for like a user test, like I mentioned, to test which is the one that you all genuinely like. Uh, will it be the two column one or the one column one and what are the components that are working that are not working and then we will extend on working on the design for it it's like a really long process but i just wanted to show you all the work in progress um so yeah that's it from me alec i think it's on to you i will stop sharing my screen Thanks, Devika. And we're down to the last three minutes, so I want to make sure we get through a couple of things in very quick order. There's a question uh, and a couple of comments, actually, that probably could draw into the same heading, which is how can we best reach out to Devika in order to become a tester or participate in that? Devika, do you want to throw an answer to the Q&A section about how they can best reach you? Um, the default place for where you can reach the team is the support forum. I encourage everyone to participate there. If you're a technical person, non-technical, anything. If there's a better place, we can direct you to it from there, but that really helps to allow for the community to kind of see in one place uh, where everyone's working. There was also um, a comment from Alex on the Roar implementation. Yeah, and that you're right. That was a really tricky aspect for us to to get right. Um, I'll make sure that uh, Devika gets your feedback and she knows how to reach out to you as well. Just looking for where I've lost my chat. There was another couple of questions on or question on ORCID integration and whether or not there'd be a, a workflow for back files to be entered along with uh, ORCID verification. Um, and I think that'll depend on the pathway you use to enter your back files. If you're doing XML import, then we're less likely to have an interactive process to verify the ORCIDs. If you're using quick submit, then we do need to revamp that plugin. And I would like for ORCID to be one of the considerations there. It's not quite scheduled yet, but that is a priority for us upcoming. So watch for some news on that. Um, and if you're using the existing interface to kind of click your way through entering content, then yes, I, I think we discussed whether or not uh, allowing author verification post-publication should be allowed, and we didn't see any downside to doing things that way. As long as the verification status is clearly indicated, then uh, yes, that should be possible. I'm just going to jump back to the presentation. Um, the last thing I want to mention before we wrap it up is that we did have a recent event in Minneapolis. I'd like to thank the uh, university there for hosting us and uh, um, allowing us to become a bit of a sidecar to the, uh, the, 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 the conference going on there. Um, there's been a couple of reports already published just recently on the PKP website on the work that we did there to do with uh, potential workflow changes and open reviews. If you're interested in those subjects, please uh, watch on the, the blog for content there. And then there is a discussion on the forum already ongoing about open reviews. Very active subject for us right now for reasons I won't describe at the moment, um, but uh, watch for more news on that and please participate in the discussion. It's tough for us to implement a workflow in the abstract and get it right. So if we have folks with real use cases wanting a certain choice to be made on the workflow, it'll make sure that when we do release it, um, it's going to be the, the right implementation for the most, the most, the largest portion of the community that can do it. We do have uh, an event coming up in October in Milan, Italy. Um, there's a sprint on October 8th and 9th. We're having the event there because of the Craft OA grant, which has been bringing so much to us for the last couple of years. Um, thanks in particular to our, our friends in Finland and in Germany at TIB and Finland at the Finnish Federation of Learned Societies. I think I got that right. But they've been working very hard to bring some features to OGS thanks to the uh, the, the Craftaway uh, grant that they've been able to receive. And it is really pushing us forward. So we're going to have some meetings on the Craftaway grant in Italy and run a, uh, a sprint as well for those days. So watch for an announcement on that and um, a chance to come and join us there. Um, we will have some presentations upcoming. There's not enough time to fit everything into these meetings, as you can see. Um, but we have done some work on OpenID and single sign-on, and I've also got some interesting work on metabase and report generation and a, a user-usable uh, user tool 
to generate custom reports from within OGS without having to do any coding. Um, so watch for some reports, some uh, video presentations on that to come into the PKP um, uh, YouTube channel. And I think we've got answers to questions in the Q&A section already. Um, probably there's some more in chat. Can't find my chat. Here we are. Um, I'll pause if anybody else wants to highlight one of those. I think we have answers to the questions that were asked. So I think we will leave it there. We will have lots more to say on a number of very exciting things. Um, so please watch for more news to come out, even in between this quarterly update and the next one. Um, some very exciting things happening. So stay tuned for that. But thank you for joining us. Um, feel free as always to join us on the support forum if you have questions or want to continue these discussions. And I appreciate your attention and support and all the work that you do that uh, we help to facilitate through the software that we write. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you again soon.